All right, welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict podcast, powered by War Strategy Group, PR, Chaos Digital, or Chaos Theory Digital, which does all your social media, digital marketing, SEO, uh, Coma Mediation, Fair and Ball, and the Herbert Trial Law Firm. I'm one of your hosts, Peter Taff. I'm your co-host, full-time litigator, Kyle Herbert. Dan, I'm your third co-host, second co-host, Bill Ogden. Bill, Kyle, we're joined by a very good friend of mine and a uh, uh, very great guest, Will Moyer. Will, thanks for joining us. You bet. And a great guest. Maybe we're early to say in the first minute. We'll see if that holds true. I, I believe it. I, I will tell everyone who's listening, uh, you guys already, being Kyle and Bill, talk and think a lot faster than I do. So I've got to keep up. And Will talks, I think, even and thinks even faster maybe than y'all do. So we'll... I will strap on the roller coaster. Ooh, we can use a different way to strap it up. Strap in. Hey, sure we let's strap in. Strap oh, in. Yeah. There we go. All right. So we'll um I keep, well, keep it on a tea like that and expect me to just to get or it's, it's, it's called served up mm, for you. It's like so Will recently uh left a long career as a uh high level defense lawyer here in town. And has now, as of March 1st, started the Moye Law Firm. Is that right? And is, that is true. So that's what we're going to talk a lot about. We've been fortunate to have a couple others who've had that recent transition. But I, I keep serving them. I didn't you. say anything. All right. Uh, but Will has a pretty interesting backstory. Uh, unlike some of mine, for instance, where you went to Texas, went to Houston, started practicing law. Will's got a little. Time out. You can't just whitewash your past. You got like, oh, yeah. And sometimes I hang out with my best friends. They're all like super famous people. So, yeah, it, not, I'm not going to name drop friends. Yeah. Hey, Austin friends, Hollywood friends, all your friends. Yeah. In the. Yeah. I just have Kyle. Well, mine, I'd say mine is boring. Will's is more interesting. So Will. You hail from the booming metropolis of Bridge City, Texas. Bridge City, Texas, for anyone who knows, is right on the border of Louisiana. Just sweat Apple south. name Bridge in from Port Arthur, Texas. Bridge out to Orange, Texas. Bridge in, bridge out, Bridge City. I drive through Bridge City uh, once a month. Yeah, that's where the that's where the cadence and the quick talk came from. So amazing. My, my my draw was much more profound at eighteen. So it got corrupted a bit. Uh, the only person on earth that went to Marquette University and also grew up in Bridge City, uh, and then from Marquette, which is in Milwaukee. Uh, if you put a ruler on a map, you can't get much farther away than Bridge City, Texas, and Milwaukee. Uh, lived with a bunch of guys from South Side Chicago, saw how the world was. It was awesome. I uh, got a scholarship to Seton Hall University in New Jersey. Uh, threw everything I owned in my golf travel bag. Flew United, maybe Continental back then, to Newark. Uh, showed up sight unseen, went to law school there, loved it. You know, know what the peanuts smell like in Yankee Stadium, know what the street smells like. Uh, their ability was awesome, uh, but at some point I just had a good clerkship there at a real good firm, uh, Sills Cummins, uh, but I just had to get home, snap, get home. So came on. So from Bridge City, which is what, I mean, mostly working class, kind of refinery yeah. town. Yeah, it's, yeah, half the town here is a school teacher, which my, my dad's a school teacher. My mother's a student aide. My brother is a principal at a school um, now. So I'm the kind of black sheep that didn't follow that direction. But hey, me too. Yeah, ultimately it's you work in the school system or you work at one of the plants, either in Orange or Port Arthur. So yeah, that's, it's, it's blue collar, no doubt. So how did someone from Bridge City end up going to Marquette University in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Scholarship. Um, opportunities that presented themselves to do things different than everybody else did. A little bit of maybe misguided courage, maybe more naivete than anything else. Uh, but it was a chance to do it different. Uh, so I did it different. What did you scholarship for? Uh, academics. I, academics. I don't mean to talk out of class, but, but why Marquette? Uh, it was largely like, free. I was like, you could have gone to California, yeah. you know, Florida. Yeah, interesting. So, um, the first semester I worked at Lamar university in Beaumont and it was a chance to transfer out. And when I was there, I worked for a guy, his name was Patrick Nero, who ended up being the athletic director at Miami. But before that, he had stopped at Milwaukee. So I was in student aid or student something or whatever else for that first semester. And he looked at me and said, we need to get you something different. Uh, everyone here is great. All your friends are here. Your family's here. You love it. It's spiritual to you. It's important to you. It's who you are. It's your DNA. But go do something different. Uh, so he took me with him. So I actually went with him to Marquette 
and we worked in an athletic program there together. Um, and I was, you know, uh, pretty not a student aid job at Marquette. It was a real kind of almost assistant fundraiser. Uh, they just started an athletic fundraising program called the Blue and Gold Fund, which exists. He started it, and I was doing That's his letter. Eagles? Doing his marketing. Uh, yeah, they are the Golden Eagles now. That was back when they were the Warriors and then transferring to Golden Eagles, but uh, the Golden Eagles now. So, yeah, so there was a, a unique decision that was encouraged by someone else to say, just do it different. Um, so I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Seton Hall was just straight scholarship. It was, where am I going to go? You know, apply at Temple, apply at Tulane, apply at Marquette, apply uh, no Texas schools, apply at Seton Hall, and Seton Hall gave me a scholarship, so I showed up. So, so you're like the Jimmy Butler of Bridge City, Texas? The kid from Tomball, Texas? Yes, exactly. So um, I didn't cross-pollinate with him in school. We weren't very good while I was there, but uh, we did follow Jimmy and his story, which is profound. Uh, Tom Ball, unrecruited, faxed his letter of intent in from a McDonald's in Tyler, where he was at Tyler Junior College at the time, to Buzz Williams, now at A&M. Uh, so he's got a pretty cool story, too. And Marquette now head coached by former Longhorns coach Shaka Smart. Shaka. Yeah. And what are they, top 10, top 15 right now? A little Shaka Khan. I, we fell to seven. I didn't see the rankings yesterday. Our best player's out. We lost to Creighton pretty badly on Saturday. But... Uh, yeah, we got a good team. So we're very grateful of the uh, UT alumni base who's not satisfied without winning every single game to kiss, uh, kick uh, out of the street to allow us to benefit from that. So, yeah, he's sir, sir. <laughs> Shaka Smart resigned. Yes, he did. He quit. I forgot. The doors open, the checks in your back pocket, shove out the door resignation. But yeah, uh, there you go. Resignation. Shaka it's Khan. Never quit. No. Yeah. Is Marquette in the Big East? It is. Yeah. And so is Seton Hall. Seton Hall. Yeah. So uh, Seton Hall, less impressive as, as a basketball team. Um, on the bubble, I saw. On the bubble. Side. On the bubble. Yeah. And I had a great time there. The law schools the, in, in the Newark. Pirates? Yeah, the Pirates. Uh, undergrads in South Orange, law schools in Newark. Um, interestingly, my wife and I just um, last year endowed a scholarship there as well. That goes to a first generation law student from Texas. Um, and the, I got asked to speak at the alumni banquet in April because they found out that the first winner of that scholarship currently works at Thompson Co., uh, who I knew was it's a little collusion. Don't you yeah. think? It's pretty uh, convenient. I stayed out of it. I said I had nothing mm-hmm. to do with this. If this kid makes it on his own, y'all hire him on his own. So no one knew. They knew he would see Hall. They didn't know the, the beneficiary of the scholarship my wife and I created. So, But he's there now. He's doing great. And so Seton Hall, did you want to – I mean, you said you – Looked at Tulane, but other East Coast schools. Were you kind of wanting to do East Coast law, by law school? Yeah, because I, 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 you know, I lived in the South, loved it. You know, um, spent some time in the Midwest, loved it. Uh, again, my kind of friendship base was was Milwaukee to some extent, but mostly University of Chicago. Even though I didn't apply to any Chicago law schools, but yeah, interestingly, when I was in school, uh, Marquette played in the NIT final at Madison Square Gardens the first time I went to New York. Cool. And then when you went there, it's like, man, this is pretty cool. If you're going to spend three years, maybe it's 50 years you stay, but three years, you know, there's worse places to be than experience the East Coast. So, yeah, I lived in Newark for a year, lived in Hoboken for a year, which is a fabulous town, and then found my way back here. And that's through a in, in, uh, clerkship with a Texas firm? Uh, no, actually, I was the Yahoo who decided to show up with no job. So um, we... Um, I was had a clerkship at a Newark firm called Sills Commerce, really good established commercial shop. Uh, one day decided, I don't think this is for me long term. Uh, you couldn't take the New Jersey bar and the Texas bar the same day because Texas has that third day or that extra practice day. Uh, you could take New York and New Jersey, but I couldn't take New Jersey, New York or Texas. So I thought, you know, which people reminded you, if you're going to take the bar exam where you want to practice, don't wait. So I just kind of shelved the whole East Coast concept, applied for the Texas Bar, and came on the took. Uh, first job was at Brown McCarroll, doing forward product liability work. First time I met Bill's law partners. Um, one was working for Rob Ammons doing Ford work, and one was at V&E doing um, tire work. So we were co-defendants in a lot of cases and adverse in a lot of cases. Um, and then one day, probably two and a half years into being at Brown McCarroll, 20 years ago, um, I think it was an email. I don't think it was a note or a stent out telex, but somebody said, meet me in LaGrange. Uh, so the Austin guys that were doing Ford work there at Brown McCarroll met my team 
uh, in Houston halfway. We were told, by the way, we're going to Thompson Co. Monday, kind of a Baltimore Colts midnight move thing. So, and I was at Thompson Co. for 20 years. So you're at Brown McCarroll in the Houston office? Mm-hmm. And you've been a part of a coup. I have been part of a coup. Yeah. Oh, is there a, like, did they get you for like a bag of balls and a player to be named later? Yeah, or was it was, what was yeah. the trade like? Yeah, it was one of those player to be or money, cash consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a small amount of cash. cash. It was lost at Lurling or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't significant. But I, I remember that the boss out of the time said, You can't tell anyone because if they find out you're going, they're going to know I'm going. And he was waiting on some deferred cops. So we had to pretend we weren't going anywhere while we were packing our office for a couple weeks. So you, it's a big uh, building, though. They yeah, probably know. I think what Will's trying to say is he's a great liar and uh, he's very deceitful. Yeah. There's a, so Thompson Co., did they have a Houston office at that time? They did. I think we had nine, 10 lawyers then, almost exclusively a covered shop, which it's kind of its chops were always coverage work anyway. Uh, we were the first GL lawyers and certainly the first products lawyers outside of the 3M guys in Dallas. So yeah, we just came over and set up shop and started working. Are you friends with Hunter Barrow? Uh, Hunter Barrow, um, I'm friends with, he actually used to work for my wife at Thompson Knight. Okay. My wife used to work for him, I should say. Either watching, which I know Don would. <laughs> okay, so you, you were doing products, Ford work, but obviously at Thompson Co., you, it, it expanded from there. It did. So, um, as we all know, I think that 2000, 2002, 2003, tire work was pretty hot. Yeah, it was in the um, and I'm not saying this is a, you know, plaintiff's lawyer for the last 48 hours, but cars got safer. Um, product liability cases went down in number. ESC, better roofs, different stability. Um, Kefler on the tires. Yeah. It, you know, ESC is a big thing, you know, less rollovers. So the volume went down. Um, and I remember looking around going, there's not enough work for me. What am I going to do? Uh, and someone said, here's a file case was called Leonard's Express. I'll never forget it. And it was a trucking case that I was a fourth or fifth year lawyer handled by myself that I shouldn't have been handling by myself because it was a multiple fatality accident in Gray County, Texas, which I didn't know where it was. Um, Where's the Gray? It's Panhandle. Um, So I remember Mike Sharp as a well-known trucking defendant had kind of the lead dog in the case and I kind of followed what he did. Um, I remember we had that Rick Daly when he worked for Mike Cadell. Yep. Uh, had the plaintiff side of that case. Uh, it was very good to work with. Um, and I just, that was the first case. So from that, took off kind of a trucking practice. Um, and that just evolved to a, you know, obviously we're in Houston's energy casualty, West Texas oil field casualty, and everything in between. So <clears throat> let's see, that, when did you, when did that happen? What year? Roughly? I don't know. It's three, four years in. So maybe, what are we in now? 2024, maybe 2020, 2007, 2008. Got it. Mr. Hanley case is by myself. I do want to chime in on something that he said. Go for I've it. never heard until a couple of days ago a defense lawyer put it that way, which is cars are safer after, you know, the, what I would say is the automotive defect heyday of 444 Firestone is kind of what you were talking about in 0304. Um, but yeah, there, I think it's it's interesting to see somebody from the other side appreciate that plaintiff's lawyers did make some changes that the lawsuits did 100 ted returner todd tracy rob ammons so michael watts michael watts and tab turner are doing a cooper tire case the almost nearly identical tire to the one we were talking about in iowa with a few years ago they're doing that in philadelphia next week uh so we've been working with them a little bit tab's great michael's michael yeah, there's little doubt that you get the barrage of lawsuits. You find some engineering records and some, you know, documentation that shows we tested this way and it's better. That those tend to find their way into the next design. Yeah, there's a reason the 44 looks like a minivan these days. Mm-hmm. Safer. Well, that's what they say about regulation. Either the government will regulate you or plaintiff's lawyers will regulate you and pick your which one's best. Yeah, you can call us ambulance chasers all you want. We're ambulance changers. Oh, what was terrible. the one? What was? Yeah. What was? Yeah, yeah. That, Alan, what was the uh, just game two company that was the defendant in y'all's firm's recent verdict? Mitsubishi. Yeah, yeah. Mitsubishi is a three thousand GT, which in high school was the car. Um, and yeah, zero rollover testing was done on that vehicle. And that was a crush roof crush. Uh, Collapse. I mean, roof crush with seat, with the belt defect as well. Um, so when your roof crush doesn't work and your seat belt doesn't retain you the way it should bad all the way around doesn't matter how cool you were yeah, doesn't matter how cool that car looks how old was the car 1994 okay so I mean, te- the case was dead in texas because of the statute of repose uh but luckily in philadelphia it was great 
Good. All right. So 15 years from from that point and then coming up to 24, you've got what? How many files were you managing at the time? I, I know this because we had to take a look at my case list and reallocate upon my exit. So about 375 roughly this year, probably all time high was probably 500. Um, it's an eight, eight, 500 at one time. Yeah. Yeah, an eight-figure book of business that ran the gamut from little piddly nonsense to explosion cases with Kurt, Kyle, Tony, et al. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> towards the end of my career, Will and I had a couple of cases together, and I was mediating with Nancy Houston. It was a— Love me. R.A.P. She's yeah, great. Yeah, it was a death case and multiple defendants. And she pulled me aside. I've told Will this. She pulled me aside. I was like, do you know Will? And I said, no. I mean, we you know, talk, whatever, and— depots but not much she's like he's he's like you know daryl barger that era like there's another generation coming up wills wills in it you really who's the rest of them oh uh, my... yeah i've been i've been told for five years you're going to be the next daryl barger and this isn't a jack kennedy comment but daryl barger is a friend of mine jessica barger is a friend of mine and jessica barger would say you don't want to be daryl barger <laughs> um but you know it's a mount rushmore deal daryl's on it the rest of us aren't going to be on it um and it just became a i don't want to do that one it's him i'm going to do it my way uh and if i stayed in the defense you know the goal would be someone would say you're going to be the next will moy not you know going to be daryl barger jr a uh, junior's junior the tray daryl barger tray um, but yeah, there's, there's a, there's a gap, uh, I think on the defense bar. There's a, there's a, there's a we've talked about Chris Trent before. Chris Trent's up there for me. Yeah. I think he's fantastic. Yeah. Chris is great. Chris was one of the old tar guys back when I was cutting teeth. I'm still, I think he's still kicking. Yeah. But just, uh, well, obviously Daryl comes in and helps, you know, high value cases and really kind of comes in at the end, either try them or try to help him get resolved. Uh, but will over the last particularly like three or four years. I mean, how many cases did you try uh, to verdict? We, we tried a bunch. So I was doing the audit for mine. I don't know off the top of my head. I know I submitted my boat application, so there's at least that many. Um, thank you, Judge Weems, and thank you, Judge Garrison. Um, so last year we picked, I picked a jury against Baker Hosteller in a frack hit case, $10, $20 million, um, well-lost case. I picked a uh, wrongful death case, a trucking case in Austin, had a burn case, a really bad burn case against Randy Sorrells. I picked a jury against Kurt, Kyle, and Tony Busby at the same time, which they're on their side of the room, we're on our side of the room. And that's Kurt Arnold and Kyle Finley yeah. of Arnold Lincoln. There had been a lawyer on our side in Texas that actually walks into the ceremonial and says, I got to deal with Kurt Arnold, Kyle Finley, and his team, talent, 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 and also Tony Busby and his team, talent, talent, talent. Little old me sitting there amongst the you know sea of sixty five defense lawyers taking lead on the whole thing. What was it Exxon? What case was it? It was the Apache El Dorado oh, case. Yeah. There was a uh, NAFTA fuel leak in the El Dorado facility in El Dorado, Arkansas. And I know all about NAFTA. Badly injured, and you know a few others less so, but still part of the part of the part of the claim. Where was that ad? Here in um, Judge Garrison's court. Okay, so I was an MDL. So it started. Um, I don't remember who had it first, but I came in late and I MDL'd it, um, knowing that luckily, I think, that Austin is now making sure that elected Harris County judges get good MDLs. And so there wasn't a risk of it, one, going to a visiting judge or two, getting shipped out. Um, and Judge Garrison got it and she did a great job. I would disagree with the uh, sentiment that Austin's making sure Harris County is getting good MDLs. Well, well, okay. So just remember, there's some, there's like three or four non-lawyers, including Yvette Ogden, who emails hello, hello Yvette. Yeah. Multi-district litigation when there's a bunch of cases filed involving a single event or a single subject matter. Usually, the defendant, sometimes the plaintiff, will ask for it to be consolidated into a multi-district litigation action. Special court set up in Austin that decides one whether that it should be done and two which judge should preside. And I think. A lot of times there's a thought that the Supreme Court being more conservative didn't want to give them to Houston judges because it was seen they were seen as more plaintiff friendly. But I think to Will's point, there's several judges who have been in Houston who have been assigned major MDLs. Yeah, so I had Kristen Hawkins got asked to roll. Do you don't get a bigger MDL than that on the state level? Um, Tom Garrison had the Apache MDL and we know who's got, you know, Kyle uh, Arkema. You had some some senior judges or senior status or I'm trying to think, Davidson's got the um, Watson grinding. Yeah, 
And then uh, Arkeen out in Orange, Texas. That's why I got to drive through Bridge City. Uh, she's got CPC. CPC out. Yeah, so that, I mean, that is a unique skill set for a judge to handle an MDL. It's um, Shout out to Judge Arkeen. She had never done, I don't think, anything remotely like it before. And she is running it as well as I think anybody can. So, well. Well, good. And so, Will, and one of the things I know, I mean, this is was up on your um, firm's websites at the time. You had a lot of success where, you know, we hear this, I hear this every day, of course, um, letter of protection, medical bills, where, you know, the defense says these are inflated, these aren't real medical bills. Um, we, we, have, we think they're more reasonable, a lower number. But you've gone in and really kind of attacked that in, some, in your previous life. Uh, at trial and have had success with that. Yeah, I was wondering if I should clean up my LinkedIn page, but yeah. uh, uh, I never touted we won because I think that's silly by a defense lawyer when someone's injured and it's a question of liability to yeah. say we won. So do y'all just like what? quietly shoot finger guns at each other across the table? Or I don't. I, I looked at it. I was going on the next one anyway. Um, you know, I, I think my reputation in town was I'm going to follow hell to win. If we're down there, we're going to see if we can win. Um, but do it in a way that's honorable, do it in a way that's fair. You know, acknowledge that someone's, you know, injured in this uh, more often than not. And, you know, the outcome's the outcome. Their lives are going to be better. Lives are going to be worse. But, you know, there's a jury that's made a decision in this when I can't control that once it's made. But, yeah, we, we went pretty – my firm, actually, former firm, uh, led the way on k uh, which is a Supreme Court case that extended essentially some discovery on what reimbursement rates look like. Our appellate group at Thompson Co. had that. Our appellate group at Thompson Co. had Henry Allstate, which essentially upended the chapter, you know, their 18 zeros are ones of intended to be a $5,000 back case. Don't call a doctor to charge you 10 for a $5,000 risk used in million dollar cases. So it was misabused on both sides, frankly. Uh, so that got, you know, was addressed uh, by Thompson Co. appellate lawyers. So it was not a particular interest of mine, but at that point, you were trying cases. I felt that was a way to appeal to a jury's sensibilities of what this is all about. And yeah, we, we had, I had tried a case in Corpus a year or two ago, I guess. Um, 700,000 in past medical. I anchored at 200,000 past medical, supported with pretty good evidence. Um, we high low the case, the jury zero, um, just because we cool. offended by the whole thing. Uh, you don't get that jury again. I think the plaintiff's lawyer missed of what are they missed left a guy along as they thought he was a health and safety guy and he thought he'd be good for him. It was terrible for them. I knew he'd be terrible for them. Uh, I don't talk to jurors after because I'm not going to have the same juror again, so I don't really care what they think. So I didn't talk to him, but I was told he was foreman and a hothead, so good for juror number one. Um, but yeah, we, we, we fought it. I've given a lot of speeches on it. Um, I think that, again, kind of the question that might be asked is what should plaintiff's lawyers do different in my view? Uh, I think the better plaintiff's lawyers, I don't say better, it's not fair. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers that I think have a different view of a trial outcome are stipping to numbers that are more along the lines of the defense number. Uh, I was really struggled with, hey, I'm going to beat up this doctor. I'm going to show this overpriced billing. You know, I can show that I can go buy this at CVS for $10 and they charged $150 and the jury's going to appreciate that. They're going to get pissed off about that. Um, Mark Lanier's office, you know, Judd said, great, wonderful. I'm in a million, you're at two, how about four? What am I going to do? I can't say to client and clients and sure, hey, let's go fight this fight so I can show off for a week and run the risk of getting a million dollars in, you know, economics and granted and then anchor that in the non-economics. Um, is it not worth fighting at two? It's not worth fighting at two. Fine, we'll slip to four. Um, yeah, I know that Kirker's office is non-suited their medical. A lot of people just non-suited even the deferred. Yep. And it undermines the chance for us to, or former defense lawyers like me, to get in there and raise some hell about it. Because there's some... It takes away a distraction. Man, it takes away a distraction. And, and it, you know, you can really, there's some, I mean, the charge master, wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a financial tool. It's nothing. Um, and it, some of the numbers aren't credible. Uh, they're just not. Um, and I think that the cases I've tried where I did really well, we fought over it. The cases where I tried, I'm like, man, I don't really like this case as much as I once did. It was a plaintiff's lawyer coming to me again saying, we're at six, you're at one, how about 150 or two? I got to report that to the client. The client's insured by saying, yeah, this is a real deal. You need to take it. So I, I think it can be mitigated with a little bit of common sense. So <clears throat> again, for the layperson, so if the, let's say the plaintiff's treating doctors uh, and you deferred or letter protection, different terms for it, they say, hey, this 
three three injections to the back and some physical therapy and Cairo and MRIs. That's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And you you hire at people who say eh, it's really more like thirty thousand. You think the most effective plaintiff lawyers, at least from your defense side experience, will come to you and say, "Look, let's not fight about that. Let's just reach a stipulation, meet an agreed number. We don't have to fight about it at sixty thousand or something like that." Yeah, because I think they're skilled enough, they're artistic enough, they're going to be able to argue a non-economic award that's sufficient without the need to say the economics are X, non-economics are Y, jury verdict Z. I think they're able to. As more skilled courtroom advocates, they can take a third of the medical on the post of medical and still have a hell of an outcome. Others, maybe not so. Maybe they need that as a crust to be able to justify a juror ask. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the better lawyers in town, we know they don't have any trouble asking for money. Um, and oftentimes it's not tied to anything to that. But yeah, with Gregory, who knows what we can do with it anymore anyway. I still don't know anybody that knows exactly what that case means. Yeah. You know two things. You can't compare it to artwork or and jets. jets. Yeah, no That's planes. It. Yeah. No F, th- well, no F 22s. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, 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 I mean, again, I, and I really like Tom Ryan, his firm, uh, as on a personal level, but when I read it, I thought, well, I do that because what do I do? I, I got a, a gentleman who makes $50,000 a year after taxes, after, you know, kind of washed of, you know, benefits and whatnot, 50 hard. And if I'm asking, turn the page and always, you know, I don't show any exhibits and closing except for jury charge. And I say, give them a year salary here, give them half a year salary there, give me a year salary there. Well, what have I done? I violated Gregory, haven't I, as a defense lawyer? God, that's not rationally tied to anything. Does that cut both ways? It has to. No, I don't know if you've Tell seen me. the well, Texas Supreme Court. Is, yeah. <laughs> My naivete. They're fun. Right. But yeah, so I, I think that, I think the lawyers that acknowledge the past medical in a way that deprives the defense lawyer of raising hell about things that can offend a jury need to be strongly considered. And I have some over 100 grand over a $25 band aid. Don't fight it. Yeah. yeah. There's some great ideas for MILs that I just thought of now. And Gregory, I never thought of a Gregory on the uh, as, a, as a sword. I, I do it all the time because there's no way to do it to say what's the non-economic value, what's the true, you know, non-empirical, non-math, non-touch it, feel it number to put in here. Well, I got to ask something. It's always anchored to wages. Well, it's not a fighter jet and it's not a Monet, but it's not anything to do with the non-economics and what the charge says by its definition. In the Gregory case, did the defense lawyer actually object during the closing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Preserved. Yeah. Well, okay. So, well, so for Gregory, it means in trial, a lawyer, I guess now on both sides, I've always looked at it as a defense heavy side. Um, both sides, you can't, when you're closing an argument, you can't use just random, expensive, tangible things to compare to the loss, the non economic loss of your client's damages. So, in that case, some ha- something along the lines was, you know, an F-22 Raptor, we just, you know, the U.S. just bought 500 of those, and they're $25 million each, or, what, you know, whatever the price was. And and they, the Supreme Court said, no, if you're going to make, uh, if you're going to compare or try to anchor it to something, it has to be in some way relatable. And when you read that sentence, you realize you, there, you, there is no anchor that you can use anymore. Yeah, they didn't, they, but they did not say what would be okay. They just said those those examples are just they, not a, to compare a human life, loss of human life to those things. So we all need to start objecting during closing, no matter what. Yeah, hundred. I, 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 yeah, if you especially if you want to protect an appeal, yeah. which you hate objecting during closing. Well, you know what I was going to say is telling you're supposed to nine plaintiffs, lawyers, and defense lawyers for two reasons. It's like one of our last bastions of respect for each other is don't be such a jerk that you object, right? Because it's supposed to be argument, right? It's yeah. really not something you can object to. And I don't think lawyers really like objecting during somebody else's closing. And also, if you do it, if you do it incorrectly, you look really petty in front of the jury. But, I mean, I, you know, Katie, bar the door now. You need to get up on your feet and say, well, judge, I don't think there's a rational basis for that argument. That's right. And to Bill's point, we can't ignore if it's the right tempo, the right need, the right time to make a record. And we don't always object just because we can. I know the appellate lawyers I try cases with, you know, pelt you with stuff, object, object. I'm like, no, because I'm concerned about these 12 human beings. I'm not worried about your appellate record right now. Yeah. I know that's maybe inconsistent with what I'm hired to do, but there's a time and a place. All right. Well, turning to your new, your decision. So you're at the top of the um, tower there at Thompson Co. And you've got, you're working on these big cases, biggest cases in Houston, which I would say is the, you know, major leagues, Houston Astros of the major leagues kind of stuff. Uh, for for uh, so represent the Astros until Thursday last week. Yeah. Not anymore. 
Yeah, well, maybe, I don't know, you can call Mr. Kibbe and see if he wants to yeah. use you still. Uh, so, I Astro last year. Dox him who? It's public record. I'm trying to remember who it was. I'm sure it was Yuli. Uh, I don't remember. I'd have to ask one of our associates. It was a weird, uh, I, so I used to represent um, uh, Mr. Crane's energy company. Mm-hmm. And so I got to know Giles pretty well. And uh, we had a lady who was involved in a pretty serious accident. There were some shenanigans going on by the other driver who happened to be a Houston Astro. And we had some suspicions that he may have been partying a little bit that night. Anyways, he was an immigrant. And so was like the Astros had rented him a car that he had just kept. Like he picked it up in spring training in Florida. He just kept it. And uh, we were to get on the salary calf or whatever. Yeah, you were talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, as well, you know, I don't know. They're renting a dude a PT Cruiser for eighteen months. Is that big of a deal? That's true. It's a burden. But the problem was, it was a case, you know, that should have tendered for minimum limits pretty quickly. Um, but we couldn't get him served because he's got bodyguards and he lives in a castle. And the cut rate insurance for the rental place in Florida was like, yeah, wait, there's, you leave us alone. We're never going to answer. And so we finally got at them. Once we got in touch with someone with the Astros, uh, I don't remember. I sent a letter to Giles. And at some point, someone from the Astros called us and said, you guys just chill out. We're going to call these people in Florida. And they participated in the case for about 20 minutes, and they just tendered it. But anyway, I don't think it made it across your desk. No, it did not. Okay, so you're in back to back to Will. Um, so you're at the top of the chain here and kicking butt but ultimately you decide recently that you uh, would like to change directions and find some, to the find some meaning in your life yeah, exactly well there that's true actually um yeah so it's not it, it, you know i i've told anyone to listen the last two months it wasn't a i'm just gonna go to my this one um you know what the hell? I know what I'm paying. I sit in the room and do 40%, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do plans for it. Had really nothing to do with it. It's built on, frankly, a long time. I had lunch with his law partners 10 years ago at Reef where they're like, you should go do plaintiff's work. And then when they, were, they saw the article law for 60, they emailed and said, we told you, you should have done plaintiff's work. What took you so long? So there's always been a brew of it, I guess. Um, but, you know, I had a life spot, you know, husband, dad sort of thing. Am I going to take that risk financially? Am I going to stick my financial neck out right now? Um, you know, we all think on the defense side, we know how it works. We don't have a clue how it works. I can tell you the last 48 hours has proven. Don't have a clue how it works. Uh, other than the guidance I'm getting from colleagues of mine on that side. Uh, but it was, yeah, we got to do something different. And different options were... And again, I love my place. I love the partnership I was at. But there was a struggle between who we were as a firm and who our client base was and how they treated us, frankly. Um, and I don't mean to make a broad form indictment of the insurance industry, but it is an hourly rate game wherein they're looking for obvious reasons, not just on the indemnity side, to pay an injured victim. I use the word victim now. Uh, you know, as low as they can pay. They're looking forward to paying their lawyers who they allegedly trust as low as they can pay. And we were running, I, on personal level, was running into some rate collision. And I had too many people in town, both sides, plaintiffs, hella lawyers, co-defense, saying, I don't, know how, I don't know if you valued doing what you're doing for these guys. I don't know if they appreciate what they're getting for you to be their lawyer for these guys. And that, you hear that enough, it sinks in. You start to have a little self-pride and self-reflection. I had a 12-year-old boy every morning, kiss him on the cheek, hey man, do it today, work hard today, do it right today, take advantage of everything you got in front of you and do it. I'm gonna go to work and read 800 emails and be called a vendor by an insurance company. Yeah, we call you, we call you that too. Yeah, while being sent out to try cases against the best lawyers in town. And it just became, it, it became kind of a value self-worth proposition of, I'm not doing that anymore. So it was either I can boutique and leave. And I had clients of mine literally say, if you walk out the door, we'll double your rate. I'm like, well, that's not fair to the firm I'm at now. Why don't you pay that now? Well, we don't. We just won't because it's a volume play. We're going to do what we're going to do. Is it go chase, um, you know, the corporate clients I was representing through retentions or, you know, the less deductibles, the retentions, uh, and be able to get that work and compete against, you know, the, the really studs in town, the Sussmans, the Gibbs and Bronze, you know, that's, AZA. So I can, I can get that type of corporate work, but I need to have a bench that can do it, number one. And then it was still competing against my former firm. 
And so the decision was instead of breaking off clients I have now and getting better rate work or going out to hustle corporate work because it's still competition in the old place, it was now I'm going to leave an eight figure book and 350 cases and walk out the door and spend two months making any phone call, any Teams meeting, any flight to make sure the work stays here. And then partners at that firm can get new clients, literally dropped on their desk and develop a book of business to help their careers. And people were like, that's nuts, man. What are you doing? And I like, know it's perfect. It's perfect because I'm in a spot in my life now career wise that it's, it's not in, in a volume practice. It can be lucrative or you can practice law. You can't do both. And I got tired of it not being practiced. So we're going to go practice again and be Follow your face. You're fine. And you had a bunch of management responsibility as well. Yeah. So I was on our management committee. I was, I think I was elected as a third year owner, which is the youngest person to ever be on our firm's management committee. Uh, third year what? When I was a third year owner. Oh, okay. um, that's usually a legacy spot where all the, you know, gray hairs get. And I was the young, you know, hothead gunslinging kid they wanted on that committee to offset some of the old white guy, white hairs. Uh, See, so yeah, I did that for 12 years, I think. Um, did you fire anybody on Christmas Eve? No, I did not. I did not. You haven't lived until you have. Lived in his. <laughs> it did not. Some people say I don't like firing people. Well, <laughs> just said it's, it's, pretty fan- it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> uh, so that was, a, I don't want to say burden. I, I kind of, I enjoyed it. You know, I got, essentially I looked at it as I got hired by the firm for a reason. So I did, I mean, I didn't get in on the mundane details of everything, but big picture, um, you know, outside of just basic administrative governance, big picture, how do we become a better firm? What can we do to put our place in the marketplace more profoundly? What type of work do we need to truly go focus on? What can we do to make better lawyers? You know, I want to be a part of that. So once you made, once you decided to make the switch, where uh, are, are you just hitting the ground running and just hustling in business or, you yeah. know, well, trying to network as well you can or it's, it's network. So the advice I've been given, he was actually really awesome. So when I, when I found out or when I kind of told my firm, they put me under an embargo for like two days. I couldn't tell anybody. They so one wanted to make sure there was a clinical psychological reasons, uh, but two they needed to get out in front of it. So like, well, he's our trial guy in our office, and he has more clients than anyone, has more percentage than anyone, has more work than anyone. It's not what are we going to do, but let's make sure we have a plan. And I was going to participate in that plan to make sure that my exit was eased. Um, so then it was, you know, meet those guys. And once I could announce, it was announced. We did a press release. And my firm was like, we never do a press release of people leaving. I'm like, well, I am because people in this town know me. And if I am not on the website tomorrow and I'm somewhere else across town the next week, people are going to have some assumptions about things that they don't need to assume. So we got a story to tell. It's an honest one. It's a true. Let's tell it. So we actually did a joint press release, which was cool. Then Walter 60 picked it out. Houston Business Journal picked it out. Um, one of the Texas lawyers or Texas law book or something picked it up. So it gave me a chance in the kind of stay wide to tell the story. And the phone started ringing. It was very flowering. Hey, man, do you need an office? Hey, man, do you need an office? Hey, man, do you need help? Hey, man, let's have lunch. So, yeah, the business model so far has been built on people that I've worked with to say, I'm new to this. Like, I didn't ask for a file in 24 years. I never asked a client, how do I get on your panel? How do I get work? Never once, not once. And now I'm faced with, what can I do to help? How can I help you? So, and how far do you live from the medical center? Yeah, I would not... Very far. Well, I, yeah. I was going to say it's a great place to get clients. Yeah. We friend all of the funeral homeowners. Yeah. All of it. All, yeah. all of it. But, I mean, we, we know the players in town, and they've opened up their, I don't want to say arms, literally, but certainly figuratively, uh, and said, how can we help you? You know, uh, what do you need? Um, there's been... You know, some conversation about do you wait the, you know, 12 months, 24 months to get a new case and a maturity, or are you better served now as a backstop and a bridge to just do mercenary work for us, you know, help us try our cases, maybe get some people to just try them out right. Uh, and it's been very receptive. You know, everybody I've talked to has said, what can we do to help? And everyone's followed up. Okay, let me just throw a hypothetical real quick. I'm just spitballing here. It's not a real case. But say I have a big case against Thompson Co. currently. How, what kind of referral agreement would I need to give you to come into the case and help me? Yeah, well, <laughs> if Thompson Co. is on it, I can't tell you. His, his knowledge, firm-to-firm knowledge goes. That's one reason it's Moy Law Firm, PLLC, uh, and not me going with some folks that once they found out I was leaving, come over here, come over here. I never pass conflicts. But on my own, 
as long as I haven't worked on the file, I got an ethics opinion from our people, we're good. Um, but I wouldn't take, frankly, a case that Thompson Co. is currently in, and I think I'd have a conflict anyway. Dang it. Stephen Vegas escapes again. <laughs> he's actually a really great guy and easy to work with. No, he's actually, yeah, so he's on our Austin office. Yeah, and everybody's quite fond of him. Yeah. So, uh, you know, dairy farm chains? The dairy farm case? No, no, it's a, it's just a commercial vehicle case in downtown Austin. The, um, did I mediate that? You tried. Yeah, okay. Sorry. It's the one, it's the one that yeah. I, I never, I, I probably have a 10% success rate in mediation. Um, I got 75% success rate with Pete. And so. And I'm going to stay on that one. Yep. Ours was 100. Yeah. 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 Because even, even the one case you and I didn't settle with Sorrel. So, you know, the numbers were the numbers. We ended up paying higher through a settlement than we would have paid through your proposal. That's the all we want that we didn't give us all the way. Yeah. You don't got to struggle his ego. Pete knows he's smart. Yeah. Come on. No, uh, I always tell people, I mean, it, it's real easy to mediate cases if they've been reported well by <laughs> by the defense lawyer and the plaintiff's lawyers have worked them up. It's, yeah, if nobody's not that hard. I always found that. Yeah. Well, I, if, with y'all, I did. Uh, if you don't have to argue facts in mediation, you can, you can cut the. BS pretty quick and can start actually talking numbers. But the, every time I walk in, it's some usually somebody on their side because I'm always super prepared uh, has a misunderstanding. It's so like my question to mediation every time is like, "Hey, can go. What's their number? We're like, what's their number in hard economic damages? Let's make sure we're dealing in the same ballpark. And if we are, then we then we go. If not, then we address that quickly." Peter and I mediated a case like a month ago with his firm. I don't know if it was with oh. his firm. Old firm, his old firm. Old firm, yeah. Is it? I don't, I don't remember. But the, we had left the, the negotiations we were at at 150 and 50, right? We walk into- Billion? The, no, 100,000. Billion. Billion, trillion. Yeah. And yeah. Peter goes, so we're at 150 and 50. And this adjuster goes, no, 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 no. We never offered 50. And, and I was like, okay, well, then my demand's back to 300. First <sighs> level. And then Peter, I was like, Peter, this is, this is silly. This is dumb. And Peter was like, don't freak out. It'll be fine. What do you settle the case for? And I'm like, well, obviously I settled the case for a hundred, right? They're at 50. I'm at 150. Are they? Where's where we've been. So we went around and around, no joke, like with brackets and circles and diagrams and Peter and my client and like, <laughs> we did this whole ridiculous dance for like four hours and then we settled the case today for a hundred there you go <laughs> that's what she gotta do and it's so i mean obviously different cases have different levels of contention but i mean like we had a lawyer who said i'll settle this case for a hundred we had another lawyer saying i'd like to settle this case for a hundred we had a goofball adjuster and then we just had peter like gently talking to the adjuster you're going to pay a hundred. You're going to pay a hundred. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. how let the process work. You got the process work. Did you think about mediating? Uh, no, I didn't. Cause I don't think I'm that skilled at it. I see what Peter and his colleagues do. Uh, I think I pick a horse too readily and I want to ride that horse. And that's a job. You have to be yeah, all 10 horses in the state. We got to be right at any given moment. Everybody knows Peter can't ride a horse. Yeah. Um, so now it wasn't, it really wasn't an option. It was either boutique or what I'm doing now. Yeah. And so what I tell people, I mean, I, when I was a plaintiff's lawyer, I thought I understood primary excess, excess, all that. And I think I did. I mean, I researched a lot of cases and wrote, you know, letters and cited everything. But I'm telling you, I don't think people understand it as well uh, as they think they do. And I'll tell you, no one knows that better than Will. What's the secret sauce, Will? Yeah, well, I mean, don't give him everything. Yeah, just give him a little taste. taste. Like they got to hire you. Is it just is it just ketchup and mayonnaise mixed together? I mean, that's it. And that's all it is. With the relish and no ketchup, thousand, thousand islands, tomato, a yeah. little bit of a one. Not nine hundred ninety nine islands. No, I mean, the bigger stuff. So I I, I handle stuff at Lloyd's, at Bermuda. So it's towers two, three, four hundred, five hundred million dollars. And you know, you there's a view of. Like, I could look at it and always say, if I was excess, I'm safe here, I'm not safe here. And then when I was safe here, it wasn't an issue. I didn't, I advise, sometimes I did work directly for the carrier um, in that kind of Lloyd's world. It was, we're going to reserve or not reserve. And then don't post reserve. I mean, that's the biggest problem. That's what the reserve's busted at because no one will set to re reserve. So if it's, 
if the reserve is posted accurately, which requires one of the adjuster to appreciate the risk, evaluate the data, and post it with the courage to post it. More importantly, it requires a defense lawyer to say, I'm not worried about getting hired again. I'm not worried about doing anything other than being honest with this file and making a recommendation, which that didn't happen. I mean, I've been stuck with, I think this case worth 10 million. Man, if you say it's worth 10, you're never going to get hired again. You better say it's worth seven. And I'd say, now what? I'm going to say it's 10. But there's an internal struggle of underreporting by the defense bar because of the economic concern of not getting hired again. And then once it's posted, then no coming back. So it's, what do you mean by posted? So once the intern, once the insurer posts a reserve, so the way the financials work, they actually have to take their entire catalog of work, right. reserve it as a financial instrument to say what are the liabilities. Oh, yeah. Got it. And then when it's that file is reserved, it's posted. It's done. I mean, sometimes it's not dead and buried, but it's... That's a liability that they're willing to... It's on their books. On their books. Okay. We told them they have to boast. So, and they, yeah. And then you've got underwriting, which should not be looking at a reserve, because you know, that's a claims issue. To say, hey, they're up for renewal. Why is the reserve still off? And then the reserve might creep down. Or underwriting says, be careful with this reserve, and then it's posted too low. Because the underwriter wants to renew the risk. And they wants the business. So the training of the business of the reserve is too high. So it's, it's, there's so many levels of being jacked. Is that why you'll see cases where big firms swap in for another different big firm type thing? Uh, usually that's either an indemnity, somebody picked up an MSA you might not know about. I got hired a boss to come in and try cases for people at the last minute. Uh, sometimes excess will hire uh, hired me as an excess lawyer to say, it's really ethically bizarre because I don't represent the excess insurer. I don't represent their insurer as my client yet because primary is defending. But they've realized while they don't collect premium on that defense obligation, it got me waiting to drop down and try. Marjorie does it all the time. Don Jackson does it all the time. The guys like me did it all the time. So when you see us come in, if you see an excess lawyer come in, the first question you ask, is that a coverage lawyer? Or is that a trial? trial? Yeah. If it's a trial lawyer that someone's got a reserve in that layer, which is good news for you. If it's a coverage lawyer, well, one, start looking at whether it's coverage risk. Or if it's someone like Bermuda hires the same two guys. If we see them come in, I'll know this case is reserved in that light, which again is good inside baseball. Yeah. What what can a plaintiff's lawyer do to help make sure the reserve is appropriately high at the front end of a case? You know, the conversations with a defense lawyer to make sure that, hey, look, we all know what's happening here. We know the case management guidelines, which are required to follow, require you to price this case. What's the risk? Settlement value, verdict value. They're never the same. If the defense lawyer prices it right, then the insurer will likely post the reserve correct. And then re-reserving the case is a task. So it's one, they don't want to have to re-reserve unless foundational facts have changed. What happened? They had a surgery. They're dead. Something changed to be able to move the needle up. If nothing changed, that needle's never moving up. And if the defense lawyer says, hey, it's five million, I think it's 10. Question, what changed? Well, nothing other than the trial date's nearing. That's never going up. That's going to stay at five. So making sure that the conversations are had as an ongoing narrative in discovery. Pick up the phone. You know who the big defense lawyers are. Hey, you don't say, quote, is this case fairly reported? How's the reserve? What do you need? What can I do to make sure that your report reflects what we think the risk is? What can I help with? You know, sending a demand is privilege. Maybe that's not the answer. Maybe it's some more engaged conversation about the facts. Because I'm like you. I, I got a rule. I don't talk facts after 10 o'clock in the mediation. I'm done. It's not going to matter. I'm not here to argue. It, just won't, it won't matter. Um, we're there because we don't agree. We're going to leave, probably not agreeing, but we either have a release from him or we don't. Yeah. I, I hope to leave every mediation pissed off. Uh, it, you, what you can do is something that's reserved. So, I mean, and it, you know, it's the it, old adage, don't bring new data to a mediation, talking about facts. And can be, by the way, here's my search for it. Okay, well, that's, it, it takes 30 days for that claims person to get with an AVP or chief claims counsel or a lit director to change the reserve. It's not going to happen then. What's an AVP? Uh, an assist, uh, uh, associate vice president or assistant vice president. Okay. Claims. But they're the ones that actually go to the head of claims or chief claims officer and can change reserve. Particularly if it's over a million bucks. I mean, Joe Blow Associates on the desk of what, 50 grand to 250 grand? They can have some flexibility with that reserve as their desk authority. Feeling above that is full through multiple layers and slide the old 
you know, doctor, the so-and-so who found surgical to eat, knock it out at all. So you're going to, you're going to learn to describe this way better on our side. I will. <laughs> you, we all live it. I think as plaintiffs in a fantasy world where we hope that when we blow somebody up for an excess verdict, that like an adjuster, like it gets yelled at or something, or like people run around gnashing their teeth. Does that actually happen? Please say yes. It doesn't. Dang it. it. Well, the first question is any, any verdict that hits either, well, domestic excess and high excess side or Lloyd's for the floor, uh, Bermuda, Lloyd's people, the first question they're going to ask is, is it reassured? Is it what? Or is it reinsured? Okay. If it's reassured, who cares? I mean, I, I settled cases, phone rings at four in the morning, and hey, it's, you know, Joe from Lloyd's, we're stuck with this demand due today. We got to contribute $25 million of our quota share of 50X. So there's a slice of, of that insuring agreement at 50 million. They participate in it with another insurer. Their percentage is called a quota share. Better explanation. Mm-hmm. And so we got a quota share at 45 million, part of that PO 50 part of 50 and it's i would pay it, you know well it's reinsured so it's only going to cost us four well then pay it if it's only going to cost you four so there's business decisions that are made that you just don't know about for sure you know who the insurer is you know if it's going to be reinsured or not or at least i think some of us in the industry will they don't post it big signs hey by the way send us a you know sours letter in this spot so what uh, canal rights up top because it's all reinsured you know there's no salt and bass and canal rights are when the excess carrier will put pressure on an underlying carrier saying you can settle this case within your yeah. limit and demand don't jeopardize our 25 million dollars by you sitting on your 25 million dollars when the case is worth 50 and you attach at 35 I to settle, settle. I smell a CLE on the horizon. Yeah, and I know a firm that does these great CLEs, but they haven't in a while. I got to ask. So uh, Todd Tracy and Hunter Craft, the second they knew I was late, I was like, Juan, join TTLA and two speak at our seminar. Yeah, I for sure filled out my TTLA application yesterday. Six minutes later, I was approved, which apparently is land speed record. You know? So, yes, we're now, and I've resisted the urge to love Will Boy out in the listser. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not actually, I, I bet you would be pretty flattered. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. You're one of the very, I've, I personally, and I hate lawyers and don't talk to as many as I can, but uh, everyone that has ever said anything to me about you has been very positive. I'm, but there, I mean, there's stuff on the internet, and some of it's graphic. I don't mean like gross, I mean like there are images. Yeah, come on. The like listser. We'll print them out for you right after this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're going to participate in a conversation about what to look for. And, you know, I won't do it in this forum, but I know certain names. If they're in a mediation, they're in a Zoom background, yeah. it's boom, I know what they're going to pay because they wouldn't be there otherwise. And there's three, four, five firms around the country that fit that definition. And they're participating. It's not a coverage fight. They're participating because somebody has looked at the risk as a problem. It's reinsured or there's insurer pressure. Which is another thing. I mean, defense lawyers are freaking terrible about realizing their client is. Who's your client? It's not the insurance company. That's your business client. Have you told your client, did you send the, quote, Stowers letter to your client? Yes, no. Did you tell them to hire an independent counsel? Yes, no. And if it's a big-ass tower, what are they doing? You know, the easiest thing on the plaintiff's bar, the biggest sea change in selling cases is when the insured finally gets scared and says, holy moly, sell this case. Now, once they get the brokers involved, the brokers start raising out, particularly at Lloyd's, because there's a different relationship with Lloyd's brokers and domestic brokers. If domestic brokers, or I'm sorry, Lloyd's brokers start walking down Lime Street, knocking on doors, saying, settle this case, that case will settle. And unfortunately, he is not going to tell us what those firms and names are. They're very secret. He's, when we get done with this, he's definitely not going to tell yeah, who it is. He really is not his hand. I yeah. can see it from it. No, this is a classic, like, you know, people do CLEs and... Um, the whole goal is to get business, right? Yeah. So I'm just telling you, if I were in plaintiff's practice, I had any case with some primary excess, I would call Will no matter, like from the very front end. Because like you said, getting the reserve set at the beginning of the case can have huge impacts, right? And so someone like Will, right, you could probably help 
with that. And it's the hundred percent most important data. When do they? So when does the reserve? Um, when, when does that go in? Depending upon the carrier, it can get set thirty days out. It can get set ninety days out of trial of filing, filing. of notice of the claim. Like they should probably. So you got to set a reserve before you even get any real information and, and, and discovery. Well, there's there's milestones, right? Like milestones. At, at filing, finishing written discovery, designating experts. You got to update that. Yeah, because you don't. I mean, the bad stuff on my desk, I could probably guess. I mean, I had conversations with, hey, what do you think it reserves to be? I'd give them a kind of a range. Sure. Uh, some insurers that don't want anything in writing, which is bizarre because they don't want to have. I don't even have an email address. No, we we'll have um, like some forms will require a defense lawyer to write out. I think the case that economics are this, some have foolish uh, uh, Excel sheets and their percentages and high lows and mids and all this other nonsense. So suppose it's just saying vertical value range to the value range. Some insurers won't allow that to be filled out because they don't want something in writing that would support our hires because they have to report it, have to report it, or they're worried about a uh, Stowers issue and they got a turnover and they got a bad faith claim. <laughs> and you got that in writing from defense lawyers saying, I, I think when I write as defense lawyer, I will tell people, look, if my report's going to be exhibit one, slide one, bullet one, and a bad faith suit. And it's crystal ball. That's what I think. Put me on earth. I've been to those before on a report I wrote. And I said, I think I was right. Jury thought I was wrong. That's the way it works. Um, but the burdens of a defense lawyer, one, having the courage to tell their business client. If they had a million dollars to work from these people and they think the case is worth three, are they going to say it's worth three? Or are they going to say it's worth two? Or one and a half? I feel like if you over, pro, over oh, you under promise, say it's worth three, and then you go to mediation, you settle for two nine, you're just saying two nine maybe. But the, I got burned once alleged to have sandbagged an adjuster. Um, in that we had a, a case, it was a Brownsville case, it was a drowning case. Um, by the only virtue of the case is the plaintiff's lawyer who was sharing the fee who won his election harness. And after that, it just was like, I'm going to get rid of this thing. So we got rid of this thing. Skilled lawyer, now skilled judge. And the case settled for much less than I report. And it was, you stand back, does you stand back? Because you're trying to be heroic in a parade. I'm like, no, that dude ran for judgment. Come on, I had nothing to do with this. You know, I didn't vote down there. And You're welcome. Didn't give any money down there. Yeah, yeah. This is called just you know, escaping, taking a lot. Lucky. Yeah, but uh, very few people do I know that would ever write a report for more. I mean, you, sometimes you do get lucky. Sometimes there's facts that maybe the plaintiffs' lawyers know that are bad facts that we don't know or they don't know, and it affects the outcome. But ultimately, it's a concept of undervaluation than it is anything else. How do we change that culture? Um, you can't in an hourly world where volume practice what matters. The volume practice is also how much attention is the big dog or big gal paying to that file. Is it an associate that wrote the report? Maybe the partner looked at it. Maybe they did. It goes out and they post a reserve off that. And if someone that's never tried a case, good luck. Yeah. You know, um, but the industry is built on volume, okay. which can be to our advantage. It's not your advantage, our advantage. Um, but he, he, there is a we 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 our we we our in the we, plaintiff side is yeah because it's going to be who's our now yeah on plaintiff side yeah who's captain now he's in yeah. TTLA yeah exactly he's in yeah. TTLA yeah I, I even paid my extra two hundred bucks or whatever I paid two hundred bucks for I don't remember seventh the seventh amendment fund or yeah. something we we I got to send bumper stickers back there from TTLA you can have them. yeah yeah uh, well you reference this in one of your trials high low agreement so. I know you like, or you have done those before. Tell me, where can those come in? Why is that helpful to both sides uh, or can be helpful to both sides? Yeah, I mean, if the defense lawyer is doing his or her job, the defense lawyer has reported to his client the risk. And if the client has risk above their limit, they can either say, I don't care, take a big number and I'll assign it to the plaintiff's lawyer and we'll go off to bad faith. The, the insured being the, the actual yeah. client client. Yeah. yeah. Which is a silly concept. It's, I'm a defense lawyer. I'm going to tell my client the insured and defense lawyer should never refer to anyone as the insured because you're, you're not the insurer. You're a freaking lawyer. Is, so I did one with Randy. I've done, I've done a bunch and is tell the client, look, you're protected. We're going to have an agreement that you're never, ever, ever going to have exposure above your limit. And I think we're right. And if they will 10, I think it's three. So I think I might be able to win it. So why don't we do this? You're protected. The insurer's protected. Let's go see what happens. And then everybody gets a verdict, which is cool to have. We get the academic outcome of you've had this case for two years. You spent several weekends and several weeks getting ready. Let's go see what happens. You know, it's 
You're not going to the Cotton Bowl and kicking off and going home. You're going to play all four quarters. So it's it's let's play all four quarters. And if your client's protected and the insurer is going to agree to their risks, then why wouldn't everybody do house money? What, when does when does it happen? When's that conversation happen? It's, I, it, for me, it's only happened once, and it was during like towards the end of trial. Some insurers like to do it either right before closing, which I think is way too late. I think at that point, you could have a frothy plan of lawyers that says, oh, yes, I'm going, brother. His name's Bill. Yeah, <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've already set this place on fire. You're done. You don't know it yet. Um, I think too early um, it, it, before trial, I, I like looking at a jury and saying, let's talk about it now. You know, see who the 12 are going to decide our fate. And at that point, fix something that makes sense for the client, makes sense for both clients. Because the other reality, too, and I'm telling the defense lawyers this, or tell the clients this, well, we'll win on appeal. Well, we have certain political demographics here where winning on appeal in Harris County isn't what it used to be. Dallas County, not what it used to be. Definitely. And so the backstop that used to be viewed as we have a backstop no longer exists. And to tell the client the following, which I've done multiple times, so what's our appellate remedies? we got some really skilled justices here, but the reality is, Anything that's a moderate to decent award will be affirmed. Maybe everything is affirmed. And then you got to get to Austin. And then you get to Austin under one, limited review. And two, what do we try that's really that? Outside of Charger and now, and now what I've heard in Gregory's. What's really going to get them jazzed up to take a case? A big ass number. So I have told the young company. Do you think is a big number? That's the thing. I'm telling clients this. And like, so to get this fixed, the legal issue, yeah. So what happens? You got to go to Harris County and get wallet. You got to lose in the court of appeals. And you have a big enough number to post, you know, 50, 100, whatever it might be, to get to Austin for their 20% tank rate and superseded. And that, uh, and that, 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 post, that post-judgment uh, interest ain't what it was five years ago. Yeah. And it's something that y'all and that we need to do in demand letters, calculate the freaking interest to put it in the demand because yeah. the difference in seven and nine, if you get, if you got a defense lawyer that wrote a report on a million dollar policy or a million, maybe there's an excess attachment and you can get the excess guys to lean on the primary. The case is worth seven or eight in report. If you calculate prejudgment on that, that case is now a million dollar case. Damn. Anything 18, 19, holy smokes, at eight and a quarter, eight and a half. It's a million dollar case. So, as a defense lawyer, I started because I thought it was credible to do it, started to calculate prejudgment in my numbers. It's one that kind of gave me, again, wrestling a little bit with the business life of, well, really, that seems pretty high. Well, you know what eight and a half looks like on that? Yeah, it matters. So it yeah. gives me a little credibility. And y'all are kind of talking over. So prejudgment interest is 8.5% now in Texas. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And so the flip side, Harris County is generally good for plaintiffs, seen as good for plaintiffs. Downside to it is it's, it takes a while to get to court because of COVID and Harvey before that. We're looking at... And we're just in every every judge has 1,500 minimum cases. Yeah, we haven't added a new court. People, I have on my desk, permissive venue in Harris County and Jefferson County, more than one, and they're all filed in Harris County. Yeah, if you did that 10 years ago, you'd have lost your license. Right, which is why you didn't make the switch 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So you wait, waited for us to lay the groundwork for you. To yeah, we haven't, or, we haven't had a new court in Harris County since like the, the late 90s, and the county has grown we just a couple million. New probate. Oh, well, that's good. Yep. So now you can file all your death, death cases. cases and your um, guardianship cases in probate court five. So the, but the flip side to the delay means, let's say an accident happened. In 2017, the case was filed in 2019. It's just getting around now in 24 to going to court. That's five plus years of prejudgment interest at 8.5 percent. We're not mathematicians or actuaries, but that's like that sixteen thousand seven sixteen thousand seven hundred dollars a day. Yeah, that's about well in your case. Yeah, no, it's one hundred sixty-seven thousand on a billion. So yeah, on a million and beyond, sixteen thousand seven hundred dollars. But it can be fifty percent of the actual. Joe's overall number, yeah. yeah. When, when it's time to cut that check, 50% of that might be interest. Yeah. And to the plaintiff's bar would be calculate the interest, put it in your demand because it's going to move the needle. Because a defense lawyer that says 750 an insurer might say, can I fight over 25% of a primary limit? Maybe. Mm-hmm. But when 750 is really 950 they can't. That's right. right. I like that idea. I've never thought of that. Yeah. Do you think that that is kind of the flip side of the volume practice is that siloing cases and keep I mean, I'm certain that there are defense firms out there that are just sitting on files, right? It'll get to trial someday. We're just going to keep milking. We're going to do one more deficit, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I wonder if the massive amount of interest that people are going to start paying 
across thousands of cases might motivate insurers. It should. It should. And and a defense lawyer is not going to self-report that. That's our obligation through a demand. That's a timely demand, not an early demand. Is that reminder to the insurer? Yeah. Like, do it. Because I, I see how many I saw the demand every hour at 300 something cases. So no one put it in ever. I've never seen it ever. It should go ahead. Particularly for another reason we talked earlier. If it's truly a million dollar case and it's not a five million dollar case, well, depending on what your attachment is. But if you have one insurer that writes the million, you got another insurer that's two X, three X, five X on top, five million excess of the primary. That gives them canal opportunities big time. Because the defense lawyer says it's seven fifty, what's the excess gonna do? Hey, there's risk. Okay, wonderful. If it's seven fifty, the math says seven fifty is really a million, that excess boat can actually raise a lot more help because canal only works leverage play only works if it's credible i mean when an excess adjuster starts settle 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 why well i can't tell you why and i just don't like the risk okay well you're in you're not in the casino business you're in the insurance business there's risk that's part of it um but i put that in the demand along those lines on demands from the plaintiff lawyer what would you advise plaintiff lawyers as far as their demands is that level of detail or should they trust you know it to be reported regardless of what's in their demand? In all honesty, I don't think I've read a demand other than seeing whose letter it is on, seeing what the number is, and seeing what court's it in, and then I know what I need to know. Um, I mean, I always have a letterhead rule because the letterhead gets a premium or it doesn't. Um, I don't need to go through the ritualistic, this changed their lives. I mean, of course, I mean, no one's going to read that and think I need it. If it's a burn case, throw some pictures in. Mm. Um, if there's pure impairment that matters, it's visual, throw some pictures in. I don't think pictures of the family at the beach help move anything. I think that, you know, a claims person is someone that works nine to five that actually in today's world works longer than that. They work hard, but they're industry people, you know, they're coming out with a prejudged concept of I'm not going to pay it. And then don't give them a reason to roll their eyes at anything. So being over the top and some emotion encourages people to roll their eyes and not take it serious. So knowing who your audience is matters. You know, I always find it entertaining the flip side of that, which is, and I don't know if they're just speaking colloquially if they, or if they really mean it, mean it. I've had a defense counsel come and say, well, you know, my, my adjuster's really upset. And I go, in the great wide world of shit I care about, it's not on the list. Hey, that is not on the list. And if an insurance adjuster is upset about a lawsuit, they ought to consider a different line of work. No, that's right. And 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 they kind of it, it mirrors the concept of they're going from file to file to file. Yeah. A lot are overworked, and that doesn't help things. Um, there's a, adjusters, and there's such a different world between a personal lines primary adjuster and someone handling. London, Bermuda, or Dem- sure. excess. And it's just the skills different. The appreciation's different. Um, we should have my dad on. It's different. It's just, yeah, it's a different world. He's a state, he's, a, he's, he does, he's the head of the catastrophe unit for State Farm now, but he was an auto adjuster for 20 years. He's been trying to get your mom on. We're not getting my mom on. I keep saying no. You'll never lay eyes on my mother. What's the biggest case you've ever settled? If you can tell us. Without names. I'm going to start here. He, you tell me when. He can't use numbers because obviously they're all confident. All right. Yeah. Um, I just use commas. How many? Three, three commas? What did I say? How, much, how many F-22 strike fighters is it? Yeah. Greg, well, Greg, read this one. Um, I sell cases for 100,000 Teslas. Probably paid is two fifty. dollars um, We had a run in November, December of everything above 100, probably six or seven above 100. It's, wait, wait, hold on, let's back up. He has six or seven over 100 since December? In December. Oof. Yeah, I mean, some of them are excess, but three of them, I was trial counsel on, so, you know. Who's your favorite plaintiff lawyer that you worked against? Um, I was here. You just have to name some. Yeah, just no, I was just going to say, yeah, they give an exhaustive. Flatter when I was watching to make sure that I didn't repeat any performances. I was watching Tony's Busby's deal where you, somebody asked him mm-hmm. at the end, Defense lawyers. Yep. And he mentioned me and Daryl, and I showed it to my wife. She says, you're top of thought with one of the best lawyers on the planet. How does that happen? I'm like, he's lying. No, I did. He's lying. And yeah, Kyle pissed him off. Yeah. He's with you. Yeah, I did. Um, but no, I I don't know. The, the collective here, the, the, the one, so I had lunch with someone, and I said, look, I feel like the old aging quarterback who's trying to system guide a playoff team into the playoffs and just be a... Peyton Manning at the end. 
And he said, no, you don't get it. You're CJ. One, you're only 50. Two, there's a gap between anybody 45 and 75. It's trying cases. You got a reputation of someone that will go try anything, anywhere, anytime against anybody. And that's going to serve you well on the plaintiff side better than it served you on the defense side. Because they have just some overworked, you know, let's go see what happens guy. Now you've got, you know, an opportunity to do things different, change some people's lives by a positive outcome, as opposed to being called a vendor and go to the next one. Um, but yeah, I mean, Arnold Aitken doing great. Uh, Tony Busby doing great. Uh, Randy Sorrells is skilled. Uh, who else? Abraham Watkins. Yeah, Mo is so is ease, uh, and Benny. Yeah, I'll stand up. Brand. Someone actually told me today that my jacket was quote the Mo Aziz cut. Is that? I said well, there was his Mo's boxer minus the holiday weight. So that's <laughs> the Mo Aziz cut. Let me get a good no, tailor. They, they, yeah, they're they're you know the guys I saw repeatedly. And the gals I saw repeatedly are all fabulous. They're, when I see the letterhead, it, I've probably used that phrase with you. It's like I'm paying a premium because of the letterhead, and I'm willing to pay it, and I'm willing to convince an insurer to pay it because the risk is these guys and gals will smoke you, and that's with really good lawyers, me and others on the other side. It's it's not a winnable case. It's just you know you got to get rid of it. Let me ask you a little bit of like inside dirt on the industry. <laughs> uh, I once like bent over backwards, flew across the flew from Houston to New Orleans, like at a red eye flight to cover a depot because an adjuster called and asked me pretty please. This is not a sob story for a 50 minute flight. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, but it was like Friday night. Like we had to like take the depot at like 5 a.m. on a Saturday at the Oxner Clinic in Baton Rouge. It was horrible, but I volunteered to do it. And then I got back and I got a hate email saying that I had rented a Suburban instead of a full size car. And the adjuster wanted me to pay for it out of my pocket. And I said, I didn't do that. That's just the car they gave me. They charged me the full size rate. And, th- and, like, and that was the moment when I was like, I can't, I can't work for these people anymore. I got to get out of here. No, I mean, the, the way it's driven out, that, and I'll say this, the claim side of the house, they're usually in the trenches with you, particularly on the stuff I was dealing with. Um, you know, they realize you got a job to do. It's the lit side of the house, which is sometimes former lawyers that couldn't cut it, sometimes artificial intelligence, sometimes just a, a straight computer algorithm that says, this is a Moazis case. This is an explosion at the Westlake facility. This is three people really badly burned uh, who have life care plans in the 20 millions. Uh, but you spent eight hours getting ready for that depot and it should have only taken you five. They'll cut three hours, and that is infuriating. And there's no little one anecdote that makes one make a decision. But I can assure you, I'm not doing that ever again. Good. Uh, two, two kind of quick inside questions. So we've had people in this probably self-serving bill for me. Uh, had people like Tommy Fibish on who said, "Yeah, I miss uh, Peter. No offense, but I miss the old days where we I go have drinks with a defense lawyer and get a case settled." Mm-hmm. Do you think that is in this day and age and this sophisticated um, insurance market with different levels and all that, is that something that can still be done lawyer to lawyer? Does it really require a forum like mediation to really to get a deal done? It depends. Um, The money being paid out is significant compared to yesteryear that it takes a little more. Uh, hand-holding with an adjuster, going to the ritual of mediation, dealing with, again, the, the ladder of authority to get to the chief claims officer to make an ultimate decision. That question is going to be asked, why are we paying this? Well, we went through, you know, Peter mediated this thing three times. It, we fought like hell. It's, you know, the outcome's the outcome is the best it gets. If I go take Kurt and Mo, Kyle, anybody else out and say, let's go talk about your case and have a drink. I do that socially just to make sure I'm not missing anything, kind of a pre-vet, pre-mediation concept. But the days of me saying, I think this case were 27.5 and not 32.5, what do you think? That's never going to work because someone's going to say, well, what happened? Well, Will went and had some old fashions with a plaintiff's lawyer and he arrived at 27.5. We got to go through the ritual to make sure the people at the end, presidents and chief claims officers of the insurance, no, they went through the necessary exercise to get the job done. But it's disappointing and done. We, we shouldn't do it more. This might be the most listened to episode we've ever had from just purely from playing. Yeah, I, was, I, I prefaced it, like I said, yeah. you guys all talk. This, this was the CLE. You have to probably listen. you got to listen to this like three times to, to really appreciate all the info. You should info. The trial. I got a legal pad that says slow down. Yeah. And it never works. The um, last one is a lot of times, and Kyle probably specializes in this, 
adjusters sometimes want to talk directly to the plaintiff lawyer to try to get the case settled. Is that productive? Is it good? Would you, for a plaintiff's lawyer, would you recommend doing that? Like an open circumstances? I think it's great. I I have no issue with it. If the claims person wants to talk to the mediator, keep me out of it. One, maybe there's some coverage issues that I, you know, as a former defense lawyer, I can't be a part of anyway. And sometimes those, as you know, help settle cases because there's an exclusion in play. There's some sort of coverage issue that's more nuanced that a defense lawyer can't participate in that conversation because it's a conflict. How about talking directly with the, if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, talking directly to an adjuster when there is an actual defense lawyer on the file? Don't care. Okay. Yeah. Hey, do you want to watch nice. calls and Chad go nuts? Because ultimately the job is for the client and if the insurer feels confidence and be able to sell a case without my input, that's cool. No, I mean, it happens from time to time and I don't feel excluded. I feel that that person made a decision either through you know, some chest beating import or they have a coverage issue. Most of the times it's a coverage issue. Uh, and it's like, you know, walk and talk. I mean, I try to walk and talk for me years. You know that, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes, and it's not the way it should work. Sometimes the other side of that, as much as they want to get the lawyer out of the way, sometimes an offense lawyer needs to get the claims person out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, the reality is I didn't hesitate to say this case is either going to get this binary. It's going to get tried or settled. It's two outcomes. That's it. And what can I do to help one of them be the most informed? Some cases have to get tried. Sure. Cases that settle don't need to masquerade as a case to get tried so the defense lawyer can make more money on the file, spend more time, which the better lawyers don't. They're too busy. They just are. And if the claims person, for whatever reasons, it's misreserved, it's under-reserved, they want to be a show-off, and I got to get to the mediator and say, hey, look, I think the, I think the smoke is $2.5 million and not the one five you're getting here. With nudge, nudge, proposal time, two, three, five, whatever it might be. I don't hesitate to give that insight. Um, coverage, and we want, we've been going a long time, but coverage stuff, if, it, if I'm mediating a case right before trial and for the first time you hear about coverage, that's a, you know, obviously kills a prospect of mediation or settlement of mediation. What can the plaintiff lawyer and or the defense lawyer do to get their head around that early so at least the plaintiff lawyer can assess that defense lawyer won't know about it often until it's too late and then the ethical obligations to their client that can't comment on it yeah. so uh the tripartite relationship is defense lawyer gets hired by the insurer paid by the insurer obligations are exclusive to the insured you are now client and if there's a coverage issue of course in scope pollution exclusion whatever it might be then i can't necessarily do anything other than if you got a coverage issue Here's a policyholder lawyer, hire them immediately because you need to make sure this whole thing doesn't go south. Yeah. Because I don't know how good the exclusion is. I don't know how good the coverage position is. I got an idea. Permissive use, that's nonsense. Pollution exclusion, that might be a real deal. So we just had a case here where the entire tower was fall of form. Primary, excess fall of form, excess fall of form, excess fall of form. At some point, there's an attachment that had a different pollution exclusion. So that was a problem and it was real. And I asked, is it real? It's real. Get a coverage lawyer. And ended up, that encouraged then both the plaintiff's side hired a coverage lawyer and my client hired a first-party lawyer to make sure that they could lean on and at least expose the risk to that attaching insurer to get somebody to sell the case. But yeah, plaintiff's lawyers have done a better job of, I think it's because of the outcomes. If you you know, the days of making 100 grand are one thing. But some of these guys, when they get 50, 60, $100 million verdicts, if they need to hire a very skilled coverage lawyer to say, guide us, both in our Stowers letters and maybe this pretrial concept, that's an investment that's worthy because they start raising the L on the coverage side, thanks, settle. Okay. Okay. Well, there you go. Very informative. A lot. Like 75 more questions, but you're going to ask him at your CLE. Well, let's so, hey, man. Give me a shot tomorrow. I got. I got two or three uh, ready to move onto your desk right away. Where's your office, by the way? Uh, I took some space at Firm Space, 2200 Post Oak. Great. So I've gone, I kind of joked on LinkedIn, I went from corner office to corner closet because it's yeah, yeah. a corner closet. But uh, no, it's perfect for me. Uh, Moye Law Firm. Yeah, you you got you to plug, 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 you plug it. This is the yeah, MoyeLawFirm.com. Strap on all the plugs. We'll put the, uh, we'll put the link in the Y-E-W-I-L-L. Uh, no, that's my Gmail. You don't need that. Don't send it to my Gmail. Moy Firm. Uh, so the marketing folks advised me, don't go the Moy Law Firm. Keep it short. So Moy Firm was not taken, so I took it and we're off. Moy Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I think obviously we've talked about a lot of the things that Will can help you out if you're on the player side. Are you are you only going to be working on plaintiffs' cases? Yeah, that's it. At least at least size ninety percent. Your team yeah. is ninety percent. So yeah, and the um, and, and that's the thing too. And, and Todd Clement, uh, big TTLA guy, talked about this. It's the plaintiff's bar. You could, you don't have to, ha- it's not like there's law firms. There's a lot of guys that are doing like you and they kind of joint venture cases with different people. You don't have to have a law firm and you only work on cases in that law firm. Yeah. And it, you know, I, I'm again, my marketing plan might be built on naivete. I don't know, but I've been told by enough people, you can help people. So find out who Juan doesn't want to try cases that you can help take some cases to try or join venture with people, take them to seed and take an estate, take a parent, take something, try it together. And what people told me this week was you don't realize the backstop that gives us. Yep. Now we got two people swinging as opposed to one person swinging. It's a huge help. And you get strikes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And everyone's just got different backgrounds and experience and, and skill sets. Yeah. Well, Will, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Fantastic. And congratulations on the new gig. Thank you. You're going to do great. Yeah. And uh, Yeti Cups. You, or was that, a, was that a Yeti Cup or a no, Coleman? Uh, we have or, a marketing buzz that doesn't allow us Yetis. Okay. It's a knockoff of some, you know, lead containing, disease containing paint but all right these these plastic ones are uh space age polycarbonate fiber actually those are nicer than a yeti yeah. can't wash that one well i got a real way that's true i'll source the logo through a website and it's probably a 12 year old and somewhere on the planet that made it for me but it's a really long good real nice job but i was hitting vista print a little heavy and baking hats and sweaters and like can you dial it back mr i don't have any clients yet so we have dialed it back we've been trying to get helmet cams but yeah, he's not well will peter's fault i mean we would love to have you back in like a year and kind of yeah, hear how things yeah. have gone. So the timer. So we can talk about my collapse as a plan as lawyer, and now you're back on the other side. <laughs> oh, no. I won't have it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, if you like this, we'll put a post, like them, like our little Instagram reels, and then mash that subscribe button. Subscribe to it. Uh, uh, Dirty uh, Verdict on YouTube, Spotify, yeah. Apple, uh, TikTok, TikTok, Instagram. Well, as a podcast, except for this. I get, I, I, I'm not I clutch. You're at, it's Peter's fault. clutch. Yeah. Sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm bad. I was not clutch. That, my brain is overflowing with information right now. So That's what we're going to call it. It's like, just, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.